Hello friends, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 282. That's dos ocho dos. How are you guys feeling? How are you guys doing? Good. Amazing. It's been a while. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I've been trying to keep these up to about two a week now. Before, you know, when I had a bit more time and I had uh, a bit more, uh, yeah, I say it's time on my schedule overall. I could fit in about three to four. At one at one point, I remember I did five in a week. But now, seeing as I'm, you know, quite busy with work and all the other stuff that I've got going on outside of the podcast, time is a bit constrained. So I'm having now to do these at least minimum. I'm trying to get them out twice a week. And if I can get free, that would be amazing. Um, I did plan to do a live stream for the Fury and Wilder fight, but I'm probably going to end up watching it somewhere. So I'll probably end up not doing that. But do look out for some more content coming your way very, very soon on this channel. So don't delay. Um, sorry, don't stress. Uh, do not be worried. More content is getting pumped out. As I said before, I'll be doing at least a minimum of two podcasts a week. That's two hours of free content. I'll be pushing it on here on YouTube channel, plus all the other bits and bobs that I plan to do in the up and coming months. But again, no point in talking about that sort of stuff until I actually do it. So watch this space regardless um what have i been doing what have i been up to since i've last seen you guys so um this past weekend it was what valentine so that was a bit quiet end up just staying in really not really doing that much and then the day before that we went out to on the same night as valentine's because i guess i don't know valentine's day is sort of like it's i find it bizarre how valentine's day especially in london you know, it's pretty, we're a pretty, um, or how, how would you say? I, I would describe London as being quite woke, right? I'd be, I would describe London as being quite progressive. And I would also describe London as being, you know, there's a fairly large female population in London for the most part. And a lot of girly girls, right? You, you do meet a lot of girls who actually enjoy, uh, basking in their feminine energy, let's say, yeah, right? So when you go to Liverpool Street, when you go to Soho, if you go parts of Lips, Shoreditch, you know, um, I'm assuming even places like Angel, Camberwell for nights out and stuff, right? You're going to bump into a lot of ladies who love being ladies, right? And those kind of ladies love Valentine's Day. They love birthdays. They love uh, colorful drinks. Um, they love stuff with glitter on it. They love photo booths, right? Those kind of girls love Valentine's Day. And you would imagine with that, with you know, quite a lot of them being in London, you'd imagine that we'd have a lot more, I don't know, activity around Valentine's Day. It feels like it, it was a bit flat. You would see, obviously, obviously, restaurants and bars kind of, you know, um, cashed out and were doing loads of, like, specials. Even the pizza shop next to where we live um, had these sort of, like, weird heart-shaped pieces that they were trying to sling, which is, you know, a bit naff, but hey, you got to do what you got to do. So everyone had their little hustle they were doing, but I felt as if like there wasn't the same amount of buzz. It wasn't really ringing off. Hall- I don't know Halloween, sorry, but Halloween. It's definitely Halloween for some guys out there. Valentine's Day, especially if you're a girl or your partner of choice. Um, Valentine's Day falls somewhere around their birthday. That's when you just want to shoot yourself in the face. I can just imagine how horrible that must be. Um, but yeah, it just didn't feel the same. Valentine's Day just came across a bit weird. It didn't. It didn't feel like it rang off the same. And again, I'm not sure if it's because it's been replaced by other birthdays. It's been replaced by birthdays for the most part. I don't know. If it, it's, it seems like every other week is some girl's birthday and she's celebrating it for the week, right? That kind of... Remember there was a time when birthday week celebrations were like a funny thing, something to take the piss out of? Now, even your most boring of friends, even your most... Um, even, even the most hermit of your friends, the one that's really like going out, has a week-long celebration for their birthday or at minimum a weekend so that probably isn't that special anymore. So maybe some girls are in an effort to outdo each other. They're like, you know, they're doing away the Valentine's Day. They're like, you know what? I'm going to put all my resources. I'm going to put all my guilt trips, um, all my puppy dog eyes, right? All my flattering on my eyelids, on my eyebr- or uh, eyelashes, sorry, <laughs> towards my birthday so I can have the best one ever. Maybe. I don't know. But I, I just didn't feel like the same amount of buzz behind it. So that aside... Because I remember, you know why I'm saying that? Because we went out, obviously, on the Friday. We went to go see Gerd Janssen play at the Dusky Residency at XOYO. More on that later. But usually when you go out on a Friday, when you go out, especially if it fell on a weekend or a Friday or Saturday, if you'd go out, most of the time when you're out and about, you'd definitely bump into loads of, you know, single people looking to mingle, right? It'd just be full of people just hunting 
for someone to kind of you know sh- um, shack up with so they don't go home alone or feel like you know their life is nothing but misery so th- th- that would tend to happen but this time when I went out nothing it just felt like a normal night out did it I didn't feel like there was any urgency people weren't really trying I didn't again maybe I wasn't watching for the right things but it felt like everyone I saw out who happened to be in a couple were you know prearranged they'd have they'd kind of rocked up together I didn't really see any you know star-crossed lovers you know one guy's leaning across leaning on the bar unaware that his elbow is now covered in other people's beer he turns around and sees the girl wearing those stupid feel of trainers looking cute they exchange glances and then suddenly they become the next instagram couple where they're posing and the girl's doing that thing where she bends her knee and he's doing that thing where he kind of looks at the sky but looks down at the same time right <laughs> so i don't know what do i know man what do i know anyway so I went to go see Gerd Janssen play at the Dusky Residency in um, XOY, right? That was the first thing I did for the weekend. And how do I start this one without being disrespectful? So the DJing was great. Let's just start with that. DJing was awesome. Um, Dusky, of course, you know, legendary UK duo. They play the right sort of music for that kind of crowd or for that kind of lineup i think they're, they're quite ver- i think for the most part most uk deans especially of that level they have the ability to play in the different venues with different lineups and have no real problem right they can kind of i think that's the beauty of growing up in london because we have such a big mix because because we're all just mixed into this tiny little city right and there's not many clubs around and we all kind of grow up um, on top of each other in the same sort of schools we kind of have the same sort of influences like i would i would you know what i would say because i think it's different in the u.s i would hazard a bet right that mostly every single person that you have grown up with especially that's interested into music has heard a piece of music from a genre they don't like you know how if you'd go to america you might meet some black kid somewhere in atlanta and you might ask him or oh, you might play him a, i don't know a, a black suburb tune and you have no idea what it is right um i think you could play a Black Sabbath tune, um, some random jazz tune, some trance thing, whatever, just a song, and someone would have an idea where that current, where that sits in the genre category, right? They'd know. They'd be, oh yeah, isn't that like some sort of acid house thing? Like, because I think we all go out to these mad parties. Obviously, we found our niches as, as we get older, but especially in our younger, kind of formative years, most of the parties we go to are just like, you know, just no holds, no holds barred, right? Especially if you grew up in like a rural town where they threw raves. People just played whatever, just whatever to get to keep the kids dancing, jumping, and getting high and shit. So we have that ability. So I think any DJ that's kind of brought up in the London scene, who has kind of had to cut their teeth playing in random pubs and bars all across the city, all across the UK for the most part, I think they have the advantage of having a little bit more of a well-rounded musical arsenal or things to pull out of. And plus, obviously, the the technical know-how because you know most of us grew up playing built on belt drive turntables. Um, it feels as if the, the yeah even the controller thing feels like it's happened only recently for the most part people just play with shitty cdjs they'd got or like really old school pioneer cdjs or maybe older or maybe kind of really shitty dinner and stuff like we just made do with what we had and kind of made it work so put us on a lineup of like you know stellar djs from all around the world and for the most part i think the uk guys will be able to hold their own which would be quite cool if they had like a dj clash thing or we had nations I think the UK would give people a good run for their money, man. Honestly, um, be very, very surprising how good we'll do. But anyway, that side, Dusky did well. So obviously, they were, you know, they're professionals. They know what they're doing. But um, I don't know what to say, man. I really don't know what to say about the venue itself. Um, the last time I, the last time I went to XOY was to go see Mercy and Drum Ensemble play alongside, I think, Young Marco. I forgot who he, was the residency. Was Young Marco? I think it was maybe Young Marco. Because XY had to do the residencies, right? Every month. I don't know if it's every month, but anyway, some seasons they do residencies where they get a big DJ in and then they essentially, I'm assuming they're doing concurrent partnership with the DJ. They kind of collaborate on the lineup and they kind of form a kind of, you know, a kind of program that runs over, I don't know, four to six weeks. I don't know how many weeks it is. And so basically what happens is that every weekend there's a bit of, continu- there's a bit of continuity there. So every Friday, you know that you're going to see Dusky play and you're also going to see Dusky invite some of their friends and family to come alongside and help along yeah, to play with them. Cool, no problem. So they got down Gerd to play. Um, Gerd and DJ House, right? Came and played all, all night long, which is weird to say all night long. Oh, that was an agreement upstairs. Okay, cool. So Dusky, Gerd Janssen and Raw Silk. Raw Silk played right towards the end, right? 
and I think Gerb did like a three hour set I'm gonna say three or two hour set so when we got in there Dusky just had them um, was just about to wrap up I think about the last hour and then Gerb sort of like got on and did his thing and obviously Ross still played um, to kind of close the night out but the venue the venue the venue the venue man Again, the last time I went to XOY was when I went to go see Young Marco, uh, mostly Joe Ensemble play alongside Young Marco. And I don't remember it being full of that many nut jobs, man. Like, <laughs> to say the least, like, the crowd was horrendous, man, XOY. Now, should I be surprised? Maybe. Um, I think, considering it was a Friday in Shoreditch on Old Street, Considering that X a while do run tons of promotions, I'm always seeing their ads pop up on my socials. They're always trying to they they for the most part. I don't know if they find it hard to move tickets, but they're always trying to get people to come down doing two for one offers and competitions and stuff to come through in my inbox. Um, it seems as if they're always pushing it really hard to like the general public. So it's a weird place because they book really for, they've got a really forward thinking lineup, right? Loads of really cool electronic music acts that we all know and love from the dance music scene but they also are very open to just having anyone and everyone rock up to their nightclub right there's no real selection process as long as you're well behaved in the queue because the queue is a bit mad right it's on both sides of the road when it gets full you kind of have to go and stand around these barricades and then you and then there's a gap between where the building and then the guy lets you through another barricade gives you a token and then that token is basically a way for them to ensure that you are in that queue. So when you go to the next queue, the person asks you a token, make sure you haven't jumped in. And then when you go through that barricade, you get searched. And then you go in for a door, hand your token back to a woman at the thing. It's just a fucking nut. And again, it's not fabric, don't get me wrong, but it's a hassle to get in there. And once you're in, of course, it's a fairly decent nightclub, right? Decent sound. Um, I would say the sound maybe dissipates a little bit if you're not standing next to where the speakers are. It can sometimes feel a bit muffled, but for the most part, it's pretty cool. Um, I, I quite like the, how they've got those race platforms. They've got these little platforms that happen to be on either side of the DJ. So if you're if you're in DJ booth and you're looking out, you've got a platform on your left, platform on your right. So it probably does give quite a good sense for the DJ to kind of read the crowd because you've got this high end platform where you can literally see people's feet, right? See how they're tapping. And you can also see people's hands and heads as you're looking down. So that's quite a cool view. And for the punters too, you get the added advantage of seeing the crowd, seeing everyone go crazy in the crowd, obviously, and obviously seeing the DJ. So that's all well and good. Um, security was a nightmare, I'd say, inside the club, not so much so outside. They come up, they in, they kind of they kind of uh, circle the nightclub or the dance floor every 10, 15 minutes with their flashlights on, making sure anyone, no one's doing anything untowards on the dance floor. Which kind of ruins the mood because again they got to do their job. Don't get me wrong, but they they really cut through the dancer. They don't even go an outside perimeter. They probably like weave in and out with their little flashlights, making sure no one's doing anything silly. But again, it just it takes ruins the night. Um, I'm not I'm not expecting it to be the cause. It's not going to be fold right. It's in the middle of Old Street. They have obligations. They have payroll. They can't afford to have any you know missteps and stuff. I get that, but. I think it's a little bit extra. They could probably do them 20 minute, half an hour intervals, maybe not have so many of them at the same time. But it's just, it's a bit aggressive. And it seems as if, like, the guys, like, I don't know if they're incentivized to, like, catch people, but they seem really on job. Like, they were really eager to make sure they caught someone. They, I think they might have caught a couple people from what I saw. People getting dragged to the side and stuff and getting spoken to. I don't know what happened. Don't get me wrong. Don't, don't like, you know, take my word for gospel. But, yeah, I think the venue kind of warped my impression of the night as a dj obviously god was awesome um you could really see the way he kind of was able to kind of uh take the crowd on a real musical journey um he's a real good um i think he has a real good understanding of the room i think that must come from all these years playing at robert johnson does marathon sets for like eight you know 12 hours or whatever maybe uh back to back with um atta and stuff so he they, they do some marathon so i think all that training has really helped in the way that he understands the crowd um, I've never seen someone look up as much as, especially a professional DJ, look up and really look at the crowd and see either what they're vibing to. Um, he does that quite often, which is quite cool to see. Obviously, he, you can tell he has a predetermined set that he kind of comes in with that he knows is going to work, but he also does try and move things around and try to work them well. I like that he doesn't really use effects to that much extent. He does loop a bit, but for the most part, there's no real crazy filters and 
high passes and low passes all the time and lay them effects. It's all just really simple and a way just to kind of really kind of, you know, he does obviously the, the classic, you know, kind of stretch, hang out the drop a bit and the bridge and kind of looping some of the chorus or some of the vocals. That's quite cool. But for the most part, it's very simple, like um, approach to DJing where most of it, most of the work is done by, you know how to say like 8% of losing weight is your diet or 90% or whatever it is. Most of his work is done in his hotel room wherever selecting the tracks putting through a playlist downloading demos getting them in the right order and then coming to play them is like kind of the final cherry on top of the cake so that was an amazing thing to see up up and close up close and personal sorry um and yeah in the end no problem but i think again the security was a bit mad the crowd was random i think maybe because it was a friday night in the middle of old street you had the after work crew you had people that were coming through because they went to see dusky People that come through that want to see Gerd. People that want to see come through to come and see DJ House or Horse, how you pronounce his name. Um, uh, then you also had the people that were coming through to do their Valentine's thing. We met a cool little couple that were there, a younger couple that were there um, celebrating Valentine's Day. And they were amazing, but they were there for the vibes and the music, the proper music fans. So that was, you know, that's there's but there's other people that you know weren't necessarily in that same sort of vein, and. Yeah, man, just a strange crowd. And then obviously you've got people like us who are going there who are proper, you know, geeks for the music. So it just made for a very bizarre crowd, i just got to say. And obviously, and also on top of that, I would say, again, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I would say I think I think they oversold the venue or they kind of, you know, maybe um, packed more people in there, in there than, than they should have. Honestly, it's insane. Like, it was so full. Like, it, you couldn't move. And I don't know if it was full because, you know, again, that's he's popular and good. The answer is popular, but you couldn't move, man. It was so fucking rammed everywhere. Um, they probably it definitely was oversubscribed. And then at the end we had to go get our coats. Oh my god. Fair enough, the cloakroom is tiny and it's upstairs, right? Up a narrow kind of stair stairway or stair hall, wherever you can, whatever you call that name of it. But Jesus Christ, it took like a million years to get up the stairs, man. It was so insane. Um yeah man so mad night um all in all good dj performance uh terrible venue um overzealous security guards and just you know a weird crowd so i don't know if you're gonna go x or y or know what to expect maybe maybe go on the saturday that might be a better time to go because you you know there's maybe less weekend warriors out um but yeah i wouldn't go back again i, I don't think personally just for me um i don't think it's worth it uh, even though they book great djs and stuff i'd much rather see someone like a good play in a in an environment where you know i don't know i don't know it's weird isn't it because london's so shit with venues like that so i guess if you're trying to book someone like good you want a good enough venue to make it worth your while it's just hard to kind of pick in it where do you go but yeah the less i said about that the better in it let's move on but that was my weekend for the most part let's get in some topics because you know not enough time in the day to talk about all this stuff so <sighs> What do we want to talk about here? Da, 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 da. What do we got? We've got quite a few things to talk about, right? Um, I'll talk about that already. Dominic Reyes. Oh, slow tire versus the man in the crowd. So this happened a while back, isn't it, right? A few weeks ago, I think now. But slow tire got into a bit of a pass up with some guy at the Enemy Awards. And Enemy Awards, I'm sure most of you guys are aware, you know, it's the chance for all the crazy so called bad boys of the industry to kind of act out show how cool they are show how edgy they are right and maybe slow this was slow tires occasion to kind of you know parade himself around and make sure everyone knows that he was the kind of you know the the what would you call them the the loose cannon of the group right of the industry and again i don't know much about the story i don't know why he got into his passa passa but it essentially um kind of maybe revolved around the post some lady called Catherine, something right Catherine Bryan or Catherine Ryan, I don't know what her name is, she's supposed to be a comedian on some kind of panel shows we have here in the UK, which I don't watch because I don't have a TV. Cue my hips a little tick there, dick. Um, but yeah, um, he got into a bit of a passer. This is the incident here on Twitter. I'm going to quickly go through it and just kind of break down what I think might have happened and offer some of my opinions on the matter. Again, it's past now, it's over, but hey, why not, right? So. Um, I didn't get so, so this is um this is a, a video from <laughs> Twitter uh, that basically t- t- describes the situation, and you can hear Slow Tie here, kind of uh, 
you know, speaking or shouting at somebody. Yeah, so she got jealous. 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 She got jealous, everybody. He's screaming about something. Smell my cologne. Smell it. Mmm. Smells good, doesn't it? Smell his cologne, right? So I'm assuming he's pulling this young lady towards his chest region where his cologne is located. Um, and she's probably, you know, feigning interest, uh, sheepishly being embarrassed. And obviously, because Sota is in a drunken, inebriated state, he thinks he's a man right now. But little does he know that everyone in the crowd is cringing and trying to fall back into their pockets. Right? So, uh, <laughs> let's... Oh, what is happening? Is happening? What is the protocol for this situation? I'm just protecting my... Okay, cool. So he's trying to get all over the host at the award show. She's being a consummate pro and kind of fending off his interest and trying to talk into camera. It's weird, isn't it? Because I guess if you're on stage, and again, maybe this Catherine woman is a fairly attractive young lady who a lot of people are fond of. And maybe when you're in that inebriated state and you're a slow tie, you might just think, Maybe because you're that, because I don't know, I'd be aware that I'm on camera and that I'm in front of a live audience, right? It's not as if, like, I've bumped into this lady at my favorite dive bar and she happened to, like, walk by me. Oh my God, wow, it's my chance. Like, it's in front of everyone. You would be kind of aware of where you're, of the environment and what you're doing. But there may be a Sotai's defense as well. Maybe he's also playing up to it and trying to create, like, a little viral moment, right? Try and do, he's trying to be, he's, he's trying to be just into her Janet, right? Maybe, I don't know. Um, but it's a weird one, isn't it? So then we move on to the next video, and this is the actual insert. I'm assuming they got into some. I don't want to watch the whole thing because it's pointless now because it's past. But they get into they, they get into some little weird back and forth, you know, um, smoochy smooch thing, and then it transpires that what it, it leads to some kind of fight with someone in the crowd who I don't know who the guy was. Maybe it was a white knight. Maybe it was her boyfriend, uh, fiance, brother, label mate, a friend, a concerned citizen, whoever it was. Then end up getting into some sort of back and forth with Slow Tide, and Slow Tide decides he wants to be Khabib Namagamedov and jump into the audience. But he doesn't quite do it in the way that you'd think he was going to do it, right? So here it is. This is the video of him kind of now being the bad boy, right? Look at him. So he's so he's obviously on stage now, banning a zoo, being a bad boy, wearing Virgil's Louis Vuitton clothing. It's just interesting, isn't it? How you can be that much of an edgy bad boy from the hood when you've got like I don't know ten grand worth of clothes on. <laughs> it's just funny to me, isn't it? That thing. It just reminds me of those kind of you know those kind of pretend gang. It, you know, it reminds me of it reminds me of um, Palace aren't like that anymore now because you know they've, they've kind of turned into a legitimate company. But remember when they were first like ratting around London and they were all wearing like taxi bottoms with loafers and talking i don't know in a certain way right and like it's just like lads you're from crystal palace like do you know what i mean allow it <laughs> like rein it in <laughs> it reminds me of that kind of thing isn't it like you know edgy i don't know man like you know you you, you sold a couple of zoots and now all of a sudden i don't know now all of a sudden you think you're you think you're goldie you know what i mean it's like mm, i don't know man anyway this is him on stage <laughs> Why <don't know? laughs> He's having a back and forth with some guy in the state of the crowd. Someone throws a bottle, which is standard enemy protocol. Reminds me of that time when uh, people threw, what was it? Was it Why the Leaf will be? People throwing bottles of piss at the stage when he was performing one time. Standard UK fodder, isn't it? When they don't like what they see, you just chuck stuff. So yeah, he's getting pelted with bottles. He starts to flash the drink of the guy. The guy keeps swinging the bottle. So that jumps down like he's coming on the middle, but obviously he's not really on stuff in it really. Because if he wanted to do him stuff, he would have just jumped down and fly kicked him in the face, in it. From that height, wearing those Louis Vuitton boots, he could have done the guy damage. But obviously he's not really on that vibe. He's just trying to act like a big man, um, which is which is a shame really, isn't it? Because he's an incredible artist, incredibly talented. Um, his previous album was great. Um, socially conscious dude seems pretty, you know, on point. But maybe. The alcohol was really a, a description. Uh, maybe alcohol really was an op opportunity for him to kind of show who he really was. I don't think so. I think, you know, everyone's allowed a little public misstep. But I also think if he was really about crud, if he was really on stuff, he would have just jumped and just fly kicked the guy like Khabib did when, you know, when Khabib jumped into the crowd and fly kicked. Who did he fly kick? Was it Connor's guys? 
it must have must have been Connors guys, right? Was who was it in particular? I forgot who it was actually when he did that kind of like you know fly kick like that. But he wasn't really on that sort of jump on stage. And to be fair, look look, look how skinny the, the security guard. The security guard's a fairly small dude, and look how he pushes Slota back into the into the stage. So it's like jumps, you know what I mean? He's not the he's not the strongest. See, he throws it back as well. You know what I mean? It's these palace skateboard gangsters, isn't it? <laughs> It's like, what is this? And look, and the woman that he's kind of, he was all up in her face, right? Look at the, the like, you're like, oh, I'm out, all right? I'm minding my business. She's got her drugs, she's out. The lady that he was all up in, up in her grill is still concerned and still trying to calm things down. She's an absolute legend. And then what transpired after the fact was that she completely, I think Sotai came out and made an apology, like saying, oh, I'm sorry, put a tweet out and stuff. And she was super cool about it. She's like, yeah, hey. Mistakes happen. I I knew you would uh, come around. Whatever. Da, da, da. I don't know. Something really classy, and it just made me think, man. Just number one, how different I think for the most part British women are, or European women are, to like the uh, their counterparts in the states who would immediately have kind of claimed victimhood. And also, it goes to show just how much of a classy woman she is herself, right? Let's give her some props, actually, because I, 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 I'm not sure I mentioned her name because this is all oh, devolves into nothing. And that's what's her name is. What's the lady's name here? Her name is Catherine Ryan, an absolute uh, wonderful woman. Like, congratulations, right? She went there, and this is like, is she actually she's wearing the same outfit? Or is that a different outfit? Yeah, it's the same outfit. Okay, she was there with her husband, actually, Oof, with, her, with her fella. So, Slow Tide was taking a bit of a risk there, doing all that kind of uh, smoochy moochy. But yeah, a, 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 a good looking lady who, again, just took it in a stride. Really, really, really classy about it. Didn't didn't um claim victimhood didn't make more out of it and need to be made out of it again i think you know she's a fairly big woman clothes has a young kid i'm sure she was well within she was more she was more than in control of the situation she didn't really want to kind of baby her or put down right and say oh baby you're right she was in control um but i just rate her for just being cool about it because in effect she could have ended Slotai's career very very quickly but instead she um Really? She loses job. What job did he lose? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna click the article from the sun, but this is from the enemy. So I apologize straight away. I'm sure he's um so this is a picture. This is from oh this is from BBC News actually. This image is a cruddy in it. Again, you know what this image reminds me of? It reminds me of you know like um you get that sometimes with Coke as well, in it, right? Where your decision you're like I think remember joey diaz mentioning it once where he said like um joey diaz the comedian the comedian said he he would never do coke before he did stand-up comedy because he felt as if like coke did it kind of numbed it kind of numbed his ability to connect to the crowd you lose that kind of emotive part of you you just end up being you do, you can tell your jokes you're obviously high you're obviously high and stuff and you've got good energy but you can't emo, you can't connect to the crowd on an emotional level so maybe alcohol is the same where it kind of stumps your decision making process you don't really read social yeah social cues right you don't really read social cues so in your head you think you're the you know you're the big party boy in the scene but then you don't know how people are looking at you you think you're cool but you actually look like an absolute mess and this picture just encapsulates it right like the lady Catherine ryan is completely within control um analyze situation being chill and he's like leering at her thinking that she's yeah she's obviously on my nuts it's like mm, is she though really is she um but yeah he apologized so big up to him he said the enemy please for my award to Catherine Byrne for she is the hero of the year that's what started as a joke between us escalator a point of shame for actions on my part I want to I'm certainly apologize there's no excuse and I'm sorry I'm not a hero Catherine you are a master of your craft and next time I'll take my seat and lead the comedy to you to any woman or man who so reflection of the situation in those videos I'm sorry I promise it's better let's talk here <laughs> and look what she says in reply I knew you were joking. Congratulations on your on your on uh, on your every on your very award worthy album. I hope you know that a bad day on the social media passed so quickly. Everything will be better tomorrow. What an absolute wonderful woman! Like honestly, well, I, I'm just gobsmacked by how much of a classy woman she is. I just expe- I just would have ex- again. I wouldn't have blamed her if she went full victim on this and used it as a moment to kind of prop herself up to speak to a bigger issue about men feeling too comfortable. Uh, being overly touchy, um, invading personal space, because there's legitimate concerns there, legitimate, like not even to be like, you know, social justice warrior guy, but that could that could be legitimate concern. But instead, 
She, you know what? He's a young kid. He's, you know, again, Slow Time's been famous for a while, but, you know, he's really went into the stratosphere over the last few years. She's aware of who he is. She knows his reputation. He probably was acting a fool beforehand. She has some contact situation. And she just dealt with it accordingly because she's a grown-up, right? That's an amazing way to deal with it. And I'm pretty sure because of because of the severity of the situation, and I'm sure his agents and manager are probably telling him that this is probably the last kind of uh, buy or allowance he gets maybe from the industry, especially in public. He can't afford to do many of these mistakes, especially if you, if you know anything about the British media, you know, you know, they kind of enjoy building people up and tearing them back down again. So I'm hoping for slow tight. It is a, a message. It is kind of a learning um, uh, curve for him. And, of, and obviously, ultimately, as well for the enemy, it's a great rating, you know, spike for them because no one's watching that shit. I don't know. Again, I'm not too sure. Unless you live at home and you've got a TV or you're at uni halls, how would you watch the Enemy Awards? I only saw the clips because I was on social. I was on Twitter and people were like reposting it and stuff. So, which is always one that always really, always really, um, this kind of confused me why most of these award shows don't just stream live on Twitter or on Instagram. People are on those platforms anyway. You might as well just like stream it live on there and have people actually watch it and make clips as they go along. Like, just with a two second delay or something would help. I don't know. Um, but yeah, um, b- big up Catherine Ryan, um, absolute legend. Oh, is she um, so t- oh, she's she's Canadian, so Canadian comedian. Um, so yeah, big up her, um, for just being an absolute uh diamond about it. Really, like I can't have anything more to say about it because his career was hanging by a lifeline there after that kind of whole occasion. And I just wonder who the guy was who he was arguing with actually in the first place. But yeah, I'm sure him and the guy have. The, the, there's no love lost there. I'm sure the guy is still going to want to be on some stuff with him afterwards. But yeah, um, what did Taylor Swift do when she came after the But Did she kind of say some mad comment? I don't know. But anyway, imagine that collab, right? Taylor Swift and Robin. That actually should be a pretty decent tune, I reckon. Um, just make sure Taylor Swift isn't on the hook. But yeah, let's move on from that one. Mm, what else is here? Oh, there's a little... Um, Let's see here. Oh, okay. Illegal apps for raves. This is, this is pretty cool. An article here from Mixmag, which is um, stating that there's people are now using apps, illegal apps or no, bespoke apps, I guess, to promote their own little illegal raves, which I, I spoke about the other day, didn't I? Um, or previous podcasts about the uprising in these kind of uh, going back to the old school or throwing these raves in warehouses and stuff back to the days of, you know, Acid House from, especially in the UK, if you know. Most of your parents or people from the old generation were used to raving in the late, mostly in the late eighties or middle of you know, mid eighties. You know, going to random farmlands anywhere or sheds and stuff and throwing these mad, amazing legal raves. And now it's kind of come back in vogue in, in the UK or in London specifically because most of our venues or most of the cooler venues that you'd actually want to go to are now closing down. Um, and it seems as if the local authorities or local councils don't really have that much of a connection or relationship with the local clubs or the local dance community, dance community, dance or nightlife community for the most part. So there's this weird friction that happens, you know, new club opens, it gets a lot of people coming in, booming is business, uh, uh, business is booming in the local council or in local community. And then for the most part, um, someone complains and then that turns into suddenly the license getting revoked, the license get taken away, which then impacts the club's ability to make money and cover the payroll. And then, you know, it kind of just goes on and on. And, you know, fast forward five years later, a big a property firm comes in, buys the land where the club's at anyway, and builds a big shiny new flat there and it's gone, right? So it's kind of gentrification is essentially ruining the light life that we have here in London. Of course, for the most part, night life in London is a bit shit anyway because bars don't open long enough, pubs don't open long enough. So essentially we are really stretching the resources that we have available. Everyone gets kind of spat out of bars and pubs at the same time and they end up kind of looking for places to go and there's only a few to go to and then they end up kind of, you know, um, what's that word called? They end up uh, really pushing those places to their limits. So um, illegal raves were kind of, it makes sense. But again, they're not the safest place to go to for everyone. They're not the most um, uh, easy to find places for most people. And they're just not for everyone, just in general. So it's not the best place to kind of promote alternative nightlife activities because it's only really res- um, reserved for a certain segment of the population. Now, again, if you go to them, you'd be like, yeah, I don't care. I don't want random people there anyway. But really what we should be having 
are safe spaces where we can go and rave. We shouldn't be throwing illegal raves in the middle of some power plant somewhere where we don't know the danger. There's no health and safety regulations there. We don't know what's happened. We don't know if we're standing on something that might kind of cave in on itself. Like honestly, it's just it's just a really uh, treacherous situation. Considering the amount of money uh, London generates through its nightlife economy, we should be able. They should be able to set up a fund or set up some places that we can go to just have you know get weird. But we don't. So essentially, this makes my cover kind of t- t- covers it. So let's talk about it now. Blah, blah, blah. The title is how illegal rave crews are using. Uh, custom apps to avoid the police from the mix mic um, says the following um, on November 22nd last year more than a thousand ravers flooded into a squat in a 10, for 10 story office block in Shoreditch wow for legal rave headlined by a jump up and drum bass specialist Jay Lin with a bone crunching sound system and no defined clothes inside the event echoed thousands of similar raves that have spanned the 30 year history of the UK party scene apart from one key element it was organised via a special design smartphone app wow okay awesome um, the app was created by London-based party crew uh, formed in November last year who asked to be named as SGL. One of its key functions is to transmit the party location to ravers in a way that can't be monitored by police, replacing the info line system where the ravers call a burner phone number after a certain time to get the postcode via a recorded message. First, we release the location via the app, says the 21-year-old founder of SGL, who has asked to be called Mark, not his real name. <laughs> Once there are 20, 200 people in the building, then it's much harder for the police to shut the party down and we can release locations over social media without worrying too much. A raver can only use the app once they have verified their identity by sending a screenshot of the Pacific social media chat and a photo of their own face of the crew's Instagram account. The app also has security levels, and a lot of people think that it's just a way of stopping the police from raiding their parties, but that wasn't the only reason we developed it. Mark says his crew wanted to break down the barrier between organizers and ravers. If identities have been verified to some extent via the app, there can be more dialogue between the people attending the parties and the party organizers. It's not just a recorded message. We're asking ravers what they want and what we can do better. Amazing. So this is a quite a cool way, isn't it? It does remind me of the old school raver things. I think they'd put posters up with these numbers of burner phones that you'd call. You'd ring up and it'd be a voicemail. Because that was during, that was obviously presiding the era when we used to leave voicemails for each other on our T-Mobile lines and stuff because it was free. You could call up your voice. So you could leave a voicemail for your friend. That's how you would basically speak to if you had no credit. You'd call directly to their voicemail number because you had a, a separate voicemail number. I forgot if it was like a code or a different number. You'd call that, you leave a message, they'd call their voicemail to hear their message and then call you back. It'd be like a back and forth thing. It's pretty cool. Um, so they've taken that and kind of ex- ex- extrapolated. So it's a pretty analog method. It's a pretty old school method that's been kind of updated into the kind of digital age, right? With the addition of the app which is amazing to see um and then obviously and i, I but I'm, I'm i'm a bit puzzled about the 200 people they can't stop the rave thing what does that mean does that mean if you have 200 people they can't get you out or is it because they can't be bothered to deal with the paperwork in the morning because legitimately police can shut down anything right they can shut down fold if they want to tomorrow right just w- walk up and say the party's locked off they don't need to it doesn't need to be a certain number of people i don't think but anyway it continues here. Some cool pictures of the rave itself. Again, I've had many a good times in Warehouse Park, especially in Hackney Wick. There was a real good um, purple patch era that happened maybe a few years ago that, you know, every other week you just basically head out, walk around, you know, um, the studios and stuff, hear some noise and walk up to the gate, see if it's paid or not and do your thing in it. Um, now it's kind of stopped. There's not so much of that happening now. I think a lot of the old crew have kind of, you know, leveled up and moved to different places or some of the people have grown out of it and just not interested in, you know, turning their place into like a squat party. But regardless, it was a good, good time and I really enjoyed myself then. Anyway, it continues. SGL has made its app downloadable via the Apple App Store and through Google Play. It's now have more than 500 verified users. The crew says it also has a backlog of more than 900 request requests that will still need to process. It's going insane. We've only done three raves using the app so far, but the systems work really well and we're updating it all the time. The risk party organizers run was highlighted November 16th when Kent police stormed the rave in the disused carpet right warehouse in Strud, in Strud, where there were more than 1,000 ravers. The police could don't like us because we're hooded teens listening to drum and bass and going mad, says Mark. Punters get a hard time and we've had quite a bit of equipment uh, seized. Bloody hell, imagine how much equipment getting equipment seized if you're running a warehouse party must be brutal man i mean you're already running you're already running it on the edge anyway right and then having your equipment seized is just nutty man that's a that's a huge chunk of your of your initial outlay cost i'd imagine 
blindly, yeah. Um, SGL believes modern technology can help Scott party crews put on bigger parties with less police interference and the strength of the UK's underground rave community. But some established crews and ravers remain unconvinced. Some tells us they're worried that too much personal information will be collected by rave organizers through the app and it's information. Oh, come on, who gives a shit about that? Um, come, like, if you're between the ages of like 17 and like 22, and you haven't had the opportunity, and you've only the only times that you've gone out is that to a school disco or your end of year six one party thing, and then you go to that to Weatherspoons, and you go from Weatherspoons to going to like a cool bar somewhere in a really trendy place in maybe South, North, East, or West London, and then suddenly you go to like a really established night out where you got to buy tickets on Resident Advisor, and then somebody invites you to a warehouse party, right for the first time, and you you know you queue up outside some mad location a primary school a funeral home you know a former police station whatever a former um old people's home right you get ushered into the to a secret door through a little alleyway cool under a gate cool over a gate and then you meet people that look like you same age as you who are from different walks of life all booming and dancing and shaking to this crazy music being played by mad djs crazy lights um, you know, balloons going off all over the place. Right, people just start like, raving, having a good time. You really gonna be bothered about people maybe potentially taking your data and sending you uh, marketing material? Do you really care about that after that experience? Come on, Jesus Christ! But the um, so continues here. But other free party veterans believe a new technology would be embraced. Uh, should be embraced. Sorry, they said squad parties have always been good for music, a DIY mentality, and they're staying one step ahead of the police, says DJ Monarchy, a former member of the UK Free Party crew, uh, brain, brain Scan. Though there are potential pitfalls with social media, it's a very easy way to reach a huge audience, he says. And if crews make apps, it's better than relying on things like Snapchat, which have been developed by big corporations. 100% agree. If you're going to choose, you got you have to choose one of the lesser evils, isn't it? SGL has already been approached by other illegal rave organizers that want advice about how to create the bespoke app. Some crews are considering including tracking functions that will allow them to see the user's locations, that will allow them to revoke access to users doing something suspicious like accessing the app in a police station. Hmm. But that's a bit dumb, really, isn't it? Because you know, you could, you if you're a snitch, you're gonna be, you're gonna, you're not gonna meet the guy at fucking Liverpool Street Police Station, isn't it? You're gonna just gonna go and meet them in the press somewhere. It could also allow event organizers to send out warnings if users are heading towards a location with a heavy police presence. Okay, awesome. Raving has always been a um about innovation, says Mark. When we started, we had one no reputation, and we had no use, no new ideas, and we had to use new ideas, sorry, to be able to compete. Parties like our rave in Shoreditch proved that modern technology can be used to put on a big unlicensed party. Uh, Will Chris, the freelance journalist, follow me now on Twitter. So yeah, really cool to see, man. Again, I think for the kids coming up now, you need to experience a warehouse rave because I think in general, it does really make you appreciate or maybe identify what area of dance music you are more interested in. I think sometimes clubs can maybe give you a bit of a warped idea of what dance music is about what clubbing culture is about what nightlife culture is about for the most part and raves for the most part are real good um i would say fast track to figure out what you like and what you don't like whether it is oh i want to be a promoter i want to be a dj i want to be a club kid i just want to be around um i like gabba i like hardcore i like um drum and bass i like jungle house whatever like it really gives you a quick learning it really gives you a really good um platform to kind of understand what works best for you going forward um so yeah good to see these kids doing some crazy cool stuff and again i like that whenever you think things are getting bleak whenever you think there's like enough nothing going on there's stuff like this bubbling on the underground that you haven't even heard about like i never heard of this app you know i still get most of my underground kind of free warehouse party things from facebook or various groups i'm part of right I, I didn't even know this was happening so it's cool to see that there's things happening outside of my remit because i'm an old fuck in it so that's good to see man so yeah check it out it's an article from the mix mag so custom it's called um how illegal rave crews are using custom apps to avoid the police okay let's go on here what else we want to talk about ba, 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 ba. what's ish uh Let's go by this one here. Yeah, ish. What's, what's Ish about? I've got this on here. It says Ish. 
Okay, this is about Red Light Radio, right? Okay, this is a, another article from Mixmag actually. Um, Red Light Radio accused of falling, of failing, sorry, to uphold community values. So this is maybe similar to what happened with Radar Radio, isn't it, right? All these online radio stations are kind of tumbling down, isn't it? Hopefully we don't hear nothing untoward about NTS. Um because that's that's the only last bastion i know again I, i'm not really a listener of it i don't really have any time for anyone that plays on there for the most part um could give a shit i know i wonder who listens to this sort of stuff anyway like where do they get most of their listeners from is it people that work in studios and stuff and just have it playing in the background i don't know because most of the offices i've worked in especially even startup they don't necessarily have a a radio that everyone listens to no one really even or even like in the most forward thinking open plan flat uh, flat flat hierarchy uh workplaces no one really wants to hear other people's music like everyone just wants to like either speak and chat or just do their own thing no one wants to be like subjected to some people's tunes right i don't think so no one really is like up for it so i wonder where that stuff is getting played i'd imagine if you're on a shoot somewhere you know just having someone with a good taste in a playlist and stuff will be cool because it keeps everyone's spirits up right when you're going into like the late hours of the night but if you're just sitting in the studio, a bit difficult. But again, if you're on your own, it's one thing. But again, maybe it's London isn't it? or the UK. There's a lot of freelancers here. A lot of people doing many projects. So maybe that's where they get listened from. But I always wondered who's actually listening to online radio shows. Because most of the time, if I ever if I ever do listen to an NTS mix, it's after the fact. It's been archived. It's like a mix show. So that this, so then that, that just turns into something I can find on SoundCloud. I wonder. Anyway, that aside, I hope we don't hear nothing untold about NTS because, you know, Red Light Radio is gone. Or it's going, it's falling by the wayside, I'm assuming. And also, Radar Radio ha- obviously suffered the same fate. So, this is an article from Mixmag. Um, this is the following Radar Radio has been accused of responding with hostility and gaslighting and silencing in response to criticism offered um, in good faith by Dance with Pride co founder Axmed Maxmed. Ma- Axmed Maxamed. Mad name. Um, Joe Kelly and Joe Kelly, sorry, who held residencies at Red Light Radio. Uh, called the tape escape until September 2019. Okay, so they they raised concerns and said, hey, by the way, you might want to look at those X, Y, and Z people because they're being, um, you know, very like, oh, Jesus Christ, who read that? So, um, very like radio co-founder Hugo Van Hell, whatever that name is, has been accused of harassing Joe and Axmed at the station's studio in Amsterdam. The co-founder, oof, last month, January 19th, Joe wrote on Twitter about her experience, saying that after her final tape escape show, Hugo asked to speak, and she requested to talk another time due to her feeling anxious and needing to return to work. In response, she also said Hugo cornered her three times and wouldn't allow her to leave until the conversation took place the cornering thing is a bit hard right again i'm not i'm just reading this i don't know what judgment to make is but the cornering thing is a bit difficult i guess cornering is a little bit like um kidnapping right i'd guess as a case like if you refuse to let somebody leave technically that's kidnapping but when you're so someone says cornering that just means like hey i'm trying to talk to you trying to talk to you and then leave you left and right so i don't know if that means he was legitimately trying to pin her up against a wall and throw a skirt up over her head Either way, you know, you're the co-founder of the, of the of the radio store, of the radio station, sorry. Somebody from your platform wants to leave, is feeling anxious and, and uncomfortable. Just step out of the way and let them go home. Do you know what I mean? Like, what are you doing? Um, so, uh, Joe says the conversation that followed was Hugo telling Joe he's cancelling the tape escape residency and banning Joe from Red Light Studio, citing a public criticism of Joe made of Red Light in July about artwork that is disrespectful towards sex workers what the fuck what's this link here this is the red light radio office so just just so you have some context of their usual level of respect for sex workers and by usual i guess i mean current anyway glad dwp are hosting a takeover today and planting sex workers is work and support everywhere so this girl I don't understand what's going on here. This is so confusing. So I'm assuming this Joe Kelly girl is a sex worker, but also has a show on Red Light Radio. She feels as if they're being the people on there being disrespectful to her because she's a sex worker and assume that she's a whore. Right? I'm assuming is this kind of situation that we're talking about here. So they make this artwork, which is really rude. If that's the case, and that's mid, like insane. And pop it up and say that right. I, I don't know what's going on here. It's just so strange. Um, 
cancelled my show the other day. On Twitter, Joe wrote that she believes Hugo being unhappy with public criticism is a classic response of a wanting to critique to always be behind closed doors and that this needs to change along the people policing how people critique instead of responding to the critique. She added that being thinking about how why people react badly defensively. A, a lot of criticism comes from anger, disappointment. B, lots of people self-critique. Their practice is based on constant learning. And C, people... Some people have never had to be uncomfortable and they've created spaces for themselves where they safety or feeling what? Axmed, who has been involved with two dance for Pride Project Takeover Red Light Radio, including Pride, says that she had also raised issues with Red Light Radio, asked them to take more supportive stance on back in the sex workers community, especially due to the studio's location to the Red Light District and its merchandise which profits off the imagery of the area. Axmed said that Hugo responded by saying supporting hashtags such as sex is work. <laughs> were too shouty for Red Light Radio, which is proudly a political station. So it's a polit- So the people on the station want it to be political. He says it's apolitical. If my shit go away, Moira Mona, a Netherlands-based professional dominatrix, posted criticism for Red Light Radio, writing that uh, artwork Joe criticizes, stigmatizing. What? The day after Joe shared her experience, Red Light Radio station with Hugo Axman shared. With Hugo Axmed shared an experience of in which he alleges Hugo harassed him at the station while Axmed was visiting. Axmed said that while at the station, Hugo came down and started screaming at him in Dutch that he wants Axmed to immediately leave the station, saying, I really hate you. Axmed says they gathered up his belongings. Who is this Axmed dude, man? He sounds, he's, he's going on absolute tear, mate. He's terrorizing everyone. Who is this Axmed guy? Let me see. What? Um, who's the co founder of this place? Uh, co founder. Where is it? Who's this person again? Let me find. Who's that? Who's this? Hugh. Yeah, who's this? This is Hugo. Yeah? Hugo van der Voen. Boy, Hugo, whatever his name is. Let's see. He's the, this is the co founder. This is the guy that's making all the mess, who's making everyone shake in their boots. This guy with the long hair. Jesus Christ, really? He's the guy that's making everyone get... Look, he's getting his willy touched by some random girl. It's not... It doesn't... Jesus Christ, you wouldn't imagine this is the guy that's making everyone shake, innit? Anyway, um, this is making... I'm just confused. This experience with... Who is this person talking in this video here? Hi, everyone. So, as some of you already know through my tweets, um, I wanted to talk about what happened at Red Light Radio. Okay, this is all long, isn't it? It's mad drama. Joe and X-Men had made statements that makes my detail that the issue is, me- is meeting their public criticism with hostile. So, the main issue here is that they, they feel as if Red Light are not taking their criticism seriously enough. X-Men said, and Joe say, first of all, we want to be clear that this is just isn't personal or unique. We've both seen this play out times. So I don't really care about this. Should I, should I just move on? It's a lot to go through, man. I don't know what the... <sighs> Again, it's hard to really make a judgment on this because I don't know the issue. It's loads of kind of stuff that's happening within the Dutch, within the you know Netherlands or you know within the Amsterdam-based scene. With Red Light Radio, I'm sure there's stuff happening that we're just not privy to here behind the scenes. But I guess for the most part, it just goes to illustrate just how difficult it is to run a business like an online radio show with all these different personalities, all these different people coming from different uh, point of views. Again, dance music is amazing; it's all encompassing, but it also is extremely diverse. Right? There's so many different raves and scenes and people and individuals and point of views and aesthetics and styles that come into one place and to kind of have it all kind of work under one roof of an internet radio show is very very difficult which is probably why some of the better ones are quite stringent about who they select and who they allow to come on their station because once you have one rotten egg once you have one bad apple once you have one um just bad attitude person in the group it really fucks up for everyone so i get i get it i get it but from the outside looking in it's just very very messy man for all involved extremely extremely messy like nothing good is going to come out of this situation if they keep airing out all their public ish all their dirty laundry is in public it's not really the best way to go about things but again maybe for the ones that are accusing red light radio of their kind of you know insubordination maybe they kind of feels if there is no other alternative you know this is the only their only point of recourse but you'd hope that They'd have find a solution behind closed doors because this is this could get ugly really really quickly. 
And again, it doesn't look like there's a real overstepping of the mark, like maybe on radar radio. It just looks like there's a lot of like, you know, there's a lack of uh, appreciation, understanding um, of the issues that the people are bringing to the table, I'd imagine so. But again, it's just, it, it, it sounds like such a headache to run a non radio show. I don't know why anyone would do it. Um, there's little to no reward really for the people running it. Um, just loads of headache. And for the people that are on the show, there is that obviously danger of being in a place with people that you probably wouldn't want to spend time with, right? Because you just come from completely different places. Um, yeah, interesting, interesting situation. Um, again, hope it gets sorted out for everyone involved in the scene because you don't like to see people in this community kind of, you know, beefing like this in public. But you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. You know what? That might be where I end it. You know, because I'm already approaching the what well, 55 minute mark, and I've got to get off. So this is the Action Zing Show episode number two eight what two eight two I think right two eight two. So dos ocho dos. As per usual, if you listen via the podcast app, uh, check out my website. It's in the description. Actionzinger.com. You both find all DJ all my details regarding myself, including all my DJ dates, all my um, artwork, photography, blog. Um, social media accounts can all be found there if you're watching via the youtube app of course smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment come back again share with your friends and again i'll see you guys another time in it see you uh probably next time probably before the end of the week so look out for that coming out very soon again i'm trying to keep up to these episodes make them two episodes a week make one a bit more loosey-goosey kind of focus and one kind of focus more so on streetwear and kind of go from there until then, see you guys very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Bye.